there, nature learners. Welcome to a Long Lake View virtual adventure. My name is Courtney and I'm a naturalist here at Long Lake Conservation Center. Today we will be learning and honing our observation skills. The skills we learn today you can use anytime, anywhere. In addition to observations, we'll also be learning to record information from our observations, both mentally and physically. We will be zooming in and out on the phenomena that happen around us in nature. Let's get ready to explore our phenomenal planet. Before we zoom in, we are going to hone in our observation skills. I want to show you an awesome exercise for observation. I find myself doing this all of the time. When I'm out in nature and truly wanting to observe, or even when I'm just bored and sitting somewhere I don't particularly want to be. This exercise truly is an exercise for your brain to observe and notice your surroundings. Today we're going to use the great outdoors as our surroundings, but you can use these exercises anywhere, anytime. The exercise is called I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. So if you could practice along with me, that would be awesome. So what you need to start out is just an object. We're all going to just use this one object here. And you use the same object for each step of the exercise. You start out with observations. Observations are physical traits that you can identify. So color, number, texture. It's not opinions like this is pretty or ugly. To get you started on observations, there's a simple prompt. I notice. Now we're on a virtual adventure, so we'll have to use just our sense of sight for these observations. But when you continue to practice this exercise on your own, feel free to use all of your other senses. Smell, touch, be careful with taste, but you could try. So we start out, and it sounds a little silly, I know, but it really helps us remember what we're seeing around us. We say I notice out loud. Then we say our observations, as many as we can list in 30 seconds. And again, you're saying those out loud. So we're going to take a look at this object. We're going to say, I notice, and for 30 seconds, we're going to come up with as many observations as we can. I notice in three, two, one. I notice that this leaf is brown in color and has all of these white spots. I notice that some of it is missing and or ripped. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fifteen, sixteen points. Are all right. Thirty seconds up. You have your observations. What you are noticing. Awesome job. Now, the next step is to build off of your observations and start asking questions. To prompt this, all you have to do is say out loud, I wonder, and then you're going to say out loud whatever comes to mind. What are you wondering about this object? You start asking questions. So we're going to do the same thing over again. 30 seconds, out loud, all of your questions. This time we start with, I wonder. Are you ready? Three, two, one. I wonder what tree this came from. I wonder how old it is. I wonder what caused the rips and tears. Was it just moving and blowing around or did an animal this leaf. 
I wonder what all of these white spots are. I wonder why some of the leaf is a lighter color and this other part is darker. Awesome! So we have some questions, right? Observations and questions. Now, you're thinking like a scientist and maybe you didn't even know it, right? Observations and questions, things that scientists do. Now, here's the last part of the exercise. And it's all about creating connections in your brain. So when you look at the object, you're going to say, it reminds me of. And then you're going to fill in the blank. And again, you're going to say it out loud. Now, you don't have to think science. Whatever pops into your brain, build off of those observations. What does this remind you of? All right, so again, we're going to do the same exercise. 30 seconds, what does this remind you of? Try and use some of those similes and descriptive words in your making connections process. So, it reminds me of out loud in three, two, one. It reminds me of football and fall and Thanksgiving. It kind of looks like leather or like splatter paint on 80s clothing. It, the texture reminds me of parchment or old paper and it smells like fall. It reminds me of fall. Awesome. So we've been making observations and asking questions and then we've been making connections to our prior knowledge or understanding in our brains by connecting what the object reminds us of. Awesome job, observers. Thanks for participating in that exercise along with me. Those skills are what we're going to use in this whole adventure. But this adventure will be about observing things that are bigger and beyond than what we can hold and observe in our hand. We are going to zoom out to look at our phenomenal planet and then zoom in. And along the way, we'll be making observations of phenomena, observable facts or events happening around us in nature. Let's zoom out and look at our phenomenal planet from space. So we start by zooming out. Here is a look at our excellent Earth from satellites in space. What do you notice about our Earth? When you see a planet from space, what questions come to mind? What do you wonder? What does Earth at this view remind you of? Even at this scale, we can see and observe so many different phenomena. Let's zoom in. Zoom in from our planet all the way to our state. And there are some phenomenal things happening in Minnesota. Unique phenomena that not many states have. Sometimes people confuse weather with climate. Climate is what we expect. Weather is what we get. In Minnesota, we live in a cold climate. Let's take a look at some of those climate factors. We can look at trends in our annual precipitation. So you can see on the east or left side of the state, we are experiencing a lot more precipitation on average than the far west side of the state. Think about what else is on the east side of Minnesota the north shore of what great lake? Lake Superior, of course. We can also look at our annual temperatures. Here, this chart or map is showing average temperatures from 1971 to 2000. 
we see that in the northern part of the state, it is much colder. And here we are seeing annual precipitation minus evapotranspiration. Both of those things may sound familiar as parts of the water cycle. What we're seeing on this map is water availability. And we can think of water availability for the plants that need water. In this northeast corner, there is a higher availability of water and moisture. And as we move across the state to the west, we have less availability of water or drier climates. The data we have been observing is truly climate data collected by scientists. The maps show us our three distinct biomes. Biomes are distinct biological communities that have formed in response to a shared physical climate. The northern coniferous forest that requires higher water availability. The broad band of the deciduous forest and the drier prairie biome. Long Lake is right here on the edge of the coniferous and deciduous biomes. What biome in Minnesota do you live in? As we observe Minnesota from the satellite view, what else do you notice? Zoom in. Wow, look at all those lakes. Here is Long Lake, the namesake for Long Lake Conservation Center. Lakes are all over Minnesota and found in all three biomes. Each lake is its own ecosystem. If you've been on the adventure ecology exploration, you can recall what an ecosystem is. The interaction of living and non-living things. Let's zoom in and look at Long Lake as an ecosystem. What do you notice? What do you wonder? What does it remind you of? All right, so we've been looking at the ecosystem. So far on our observations, we've started at the global scale, the biosphere. Then we've zoomed in to the Minnesota biomes. In particular, we are in the coniferous forest here at Long Lake Conservation Center. Then we've zoomed in even more to the ecosystem found here in Long Lake. We're following the levels of the ecological hierarchy from big down to small. Next in our zooming in, we're going to look at the community within the ecosystem. A community is groups of living things interacting. So recall an ecosystem is living and non-living things. A community is the living things in their interactions. What do you notice here at Long Lake? What is the community? What species make up the community? What are you wondering about them? All right, so to help with your observations of the community, I'm going to dig in and do some sampling of this ecosystem. See what living things we have here. Now, one of the living things we can observe right in front of us are these tall grasses and reeds. They're a living thing. Now, what I'm thinking is that there are quite a few living things interacting with these grasses, using the grasses as shelter and food and habitat. So I'm going to dig in and see what we find in Long Lake. Oh, I'm going to pull them out and put them in my sample bucket here, which I did put water in to keep any living thing alive. I don't want to harm living things. And after I'm done sampling, I will 
put everything back. Pulling up things, and then as soon as I pulled it up, I saw something moving. Now that's still alive. Again, these insects are right in those plants here. The plants on the edge, the living things, are providing valuable resources. It's called the littoral zone of the lake or the nursery because lots of living things use the tall grasses for laying eggs. All right, and as I'm digging, think about what is in the lake. Now, typically I think what comes to mind for living things, animals, would be vertebrates, things with backbones, right? Fish, frogs, turtles, birds using the lake. But here in the littoral zone, we're finding invertebrates. Invertebrates that we can see with our naked eye. It's called macro invertebrate. These are super important to the ecosystem as a whole. Can you think of any uses or roles that the macro invertebrates play in this lake ecosystem? Oh, wow. good haul. Look right here. There's one. Oh, they're blending in so well. And here's another. Now, I haven't seen any of our true vertebrates as of yet, but just before I started sampling here on the dock, we could hear frogs singing. So they're in here as well. And I would think that maybe earlier today with the sun shining, we could have seen a turtle basking in the sun. Oh wow, here's another one. This one's a lot bigger and different. We've been noticing and really observing and investigating the community of living things here in Long Lake. We've been taking a sample of what's living right here in the littoral zone. We are collecting macro invertebrates. So now we're going to go dump out our bucket into a wider container so we can see our samples and really observe the living things we collected. Let's go. All right. So we've been right in the littoral zone of Long Lake observing that community and the phenomena that happens there. Now from community, we can zoom in even more and look at population, the number of individuals in a given area or ecosystem. We just took a sample of macro invertebrates. So let's see what our sample population size is and then continue to observe our collections. I'm going to dump the bucket out here gently into this wide, shallow pan so that I can easily see our collections. It was helpful to keep the bucket water fairly clean so that then we could observe the living things. Now I have some tools here just like a simple spoon and I do have some straggler living things here at the bottom of the bucket. I want to observe and identify our population. Again, the population is the number of individuals. Oh, wow. Here we have a caddisfly larva. Caddisfly larva mask themselves using their surroundings. It's similar to making a cocoon. That's kind of the idea because they're in their larval state and going to metamorphosize. They're protecting their bodies by masking their bodies. So here it is, you see this stick here and then there's this larva coming out of the stick. That is the caddis fly larva. So here we go. Oh, did you see it? It went back into its mask. So it's just using its surroundings to mask. 
So now, if we're keeping count, our population size, we know that we have one caddisfly larva. Here are those multiple macroinvertebrates we were finding. These are dragonfly larvae. So dragonflies lay their eggs in that littoral zone. And these larvae overwinter in the frozen lake. Some species for years and years. At the right time, they'll climb up on those tall reeds, go through metamorphosis and emerge as flying dragonflies. What a phenomenon to happen. Metamorphosis, total change in separate stages of life. Can you think of any other living things that do that? Here we have another dragonfly larva. So population size is up to three, very gently, four, and we know there's, oh, four, and we know there's a fifth, and we're up to five dragonfly larva for our population size. I'm seeing another living thing in this community. We have these small snails here, so there's one for their population. Let's see, this is a different species. And we have one for that population, so two for that one. Now that we've been observing, we've maybe been asking questions. Maybe you answered some of those questions. What's the role of these macroinvertebrates in their ecosystem? Well, if they survive, they are becoming insects. Caddisfly larvae and dragonflies both will metamorphosize and have wings and become flying insects. In their larval stage and egg stage, they are also a food source for many things living in the lake, like frogs and toads and fish. So we got to take a close look at the community, the living things interacting, and we were able to get a sample of the population of the littoral zone of the lake. We have one caddisfly larva, five dragonfly larva, two snails, I'll have to look up the species, and one other snail that I would say is a different species based on its characteristics. So now we can look from the population to the individual organism. We can zoom in even more. Now again, phenomena happen at all of these levels, from the biosphere down to the individual growth, metabolism, change, all are phenomenons, observable events or facts. There, you can see it coming out of its mass. All of these observations at every scale of the ecological hierarchy can be considered a science. Maybe you thought you were just observing what was going on in nature. That's a science. Phenology, pheno or phenomenon, ology, the study of phenomenon. Phenologists have an awesome job. They get out in nature and observe just like we've been doing. They record information. I know phenologists that record with technology and spreadsheets. I also know phenologists that record with a simple nature journal, a notebook and a pencil, and they record information, the phenomenon that's happening around them in nature. And then they share that information. That's the most important part about being a phenologist is that they share the information. How many dragonfly larvae? How many caddisfly larvae? That is super important information to people like limnologists, people who study lakes and especially water quality. Phenology is a fun branch of scientists that yes, there are PhDs in phenology, but you and me, we can be phenologists too. All we have to do is get out, observe, record information and share. So the last part of this adventure 
we're going to focus on that skill of recording information. We've been doing an awesome job observing phenomenon so far. So let's record information. We're going to look at an individual who we would find in this Long Lake community who would maybe interact with these living things in a predatory relationship. We're going to take a close look at an American toad and record all of the information that we can. All right, so here we have the American toad, another community member of the Long Lake ecosystem. Toads will start aquatic as tadpoles, eating things like those macro invertebrates we found in the littoral zone just a few moments ago. Then they will also metamorphosize, what a phenomenon, into the toad and become more of a land animal. Now, the last step in our observation-based adventure is to record our observations. I'd like you to follow along with me recording observations of the American toad. So if you could grab a piece of paper, doesn't have to be a notebook, nothing fancy, just a piece of paper and something to write with. If you need to pause, just hit pause, go grab something. We will be recording our phenology observations. So we have our pen and paper. The first step as phenologists is to record what you know about your surroundings. You're going to want to put location, date, time, even weather conditions. So because we're recording observations from Long Lake Conservation Center, you can put on your paper Long Lake Conservation Center. The date is May 6, 2020. It is afternoon and it is a beautiful sunny day, about 60 degrees. You'll want all of that information in your phenology record or nature journal. All right, now here's the next step. We are going to take two minutes and only two minutes to record as much information about the toad as we can. We can write and we can also draw. Now, if you're like, Courtney, I'm no artist, that's okay. Visual information is super helpful. So practice writing and drawing to record the information about the toad and use those observation skills. What do you notice? And put it on your paper. All right, so feeling ready. You have something to write with. You have paper in front of you. We'll zoom in on the toad so you can get a close look and we'll take two minutes to record all of the information we can. Are you ready phenologists? Let's go in three, two, one.
All right, two minutes up. That's not a long time, but we have a good record of the toad shape and some descriptions. Maybe you have more written down than I did. And then from here, I could use this information if I were, you know, not able to see the toad or observe the toad anymore and fill in some of my observations with research and fill in some of my questions with research as well. So one of the things I noticed was this big flat circle here behind its eyeball and I'm wondering what that is. And I'm wondering why it has this smooth ridge down its back and what all the bumps are for. Are they really warts? Hopefully you have something on your paper too. You've recorded some information like a phenologist and from here your observations can be built on. You can ask questions and draw more connections. Awesome job, phenologists. Wow, what a phenomenal planet we have. And what an awesome job you all have been doing making observations and practicing phenology. The skills you learned on this adventure, you could do anytime, anywhere. I actually challenge you to repeat this adventure wherever you can. Hopefully it's in nature so you can put those phenology and observation skills to work. You just get out, you observe, you record, and you share your information. You can share with family and friends, or you can share as a citizen scientist practicing and recording phenology. Thank you for exploring and observing along with me. You made scientific observations, asked wonderful questions, and made connections, really and truly learning about our planet and the phenomena that happen at the multiple levels of the ecological hierarchy. Long Lake Conservation Center is a part of the Aiken County Parks and Trails system. We're open to the public for visitors to come and explore and observe nature. Long Lake naturalists lead groups with reservations on adventures a lot like this one. We observe nature and dig in to the lake, collecting macroinvertebrates and discovering their role in the ecosystem. We hope to see you sometime at Long Lake Conservation Center. Until then, if safe for you, get outside, explore, conserve, learn about, and just appreciate nature.